século XI. Vamos retomar com Lai Zainilovic, é professor na nova School of Economics, Business and Economics e diretor de Data Science for Social Good Europe. E ele vai-nos falar disto. É também doutorado do programa da Carnegie Mellon Portugal em mudança tecnológica e empreendedorismo. O Leide vai-nos falar de como podemos utilizar os dados, o, o célebre Big Data de que hoje falamos todos, para melhorar a nossa sociedade. Vamos ouvir. Leide, it's up to you. So, thank you all and I hope you had a wonderful lunch. Um, my name is Leo Zinilovic, I'm assistant professor at Nova School of Business and Economics and I'm director of Data Science for Social Good Europe. And I was challenged, I don't know if the slides are here, yes they are, with this question, are we going somewhere fast? And I first wanted to resolve this part of the ambiguity that is inherent to the question somewhere. I'll assume that this refers to our society and how is it impacted by technology. And we as humans are always kind of desiring this certainty. We cannot really cope well with the uncertainty. So to respond to this desire for certainty, and if you ask me to pick colors and to choose yes or no, I will choose no. We're not going fast with our technology. And let me argue why. Before I do that, I want to remind you what we could do just 40 years ago with technology. Look at this small computer. It took humans to the moon. And these super this supercomputer that you can see here was unveiled recently. And look how many calculations per second can this computer do. If we could go to the moon with this little guy, imagine what we can do with this new computer. All that I'm going to talk today actually uh, comes from the program, an initiative of Data Science for Social Good, an initiative that started in Chicago uh, in 2013 by Raid Ghani, who was, chief data, who was chief data scientist of Obama for America in 2012. And this initiative was brought to Europe by Nova School of Business and Economics with the help of Kashkaish Municipality, and I'm giving my thanks to all of them. So we know that there is a spectacular world of opportunities because of technology. And we have seen that there is a lot of data, and we, we know now that there is a computational power. So what could we do with that? One of the things is we can describe the past. What does it mean that we can describe the past? So we used uh, mobile records data. You know, you have uh, this phone of yours, this little phone, and it's connected to the base station, and every here and there it pings and leaves a little trace where you are. And we used every minute information from every foreigner in Tuscany, in Italy, that picturesque region, to understand and help uh, Toscana Promozione Turistica describe where are the tourists going. And after a couple of, uh, well, couple of months of work, we were able to cluster people to say, here is where You know, people from the United States are going during summer. Here is well, Germans are going during winter, et cetera, et cetera. And what you can see here are just four representative tourists in Tuscany. What else can we do? The students of, at Nova School of Business and Economics, they use machine learning to train classification algorithms to help municipality of Rotterdam understand over time the greenification of rooftops in Rotterdam. What does it mean, the greenification of rooftops? Well, you know, in Rotterdam, there is 14 square, square kilometers of flat rooftops. What do people use these rooftops for? And municipality wanted to have as many green, green rooftops as possible. But, you know, it's a laborer's job. Who is going to check whether the rooftop is green or not? So our students built a tool for the municipality to look over the years how many new rooftops are green. Okay. And, you know, once we have seen that this is possible in Rotterdam, we exercised a little bit of activity with the Kamera Municipal of Kashkaish. And if you see this image, in 2014 there was a construction site, in 2015 there are 13 more swimming pools. And now Kamera Municipal of Kashkaish, by the use, with the use of this tool, can understand the evolution of the municipality. Okay, we can describe past and the evolution of things. What else can we do? We can detect ongoing events. Now, I know this would have been much better if we talked about it before the lunch. Imagine a tuna steak, that beautifully grilled, perfectly delicious tuna steak. Well, let me share something with you. 
there is a high likelihood that this tuna steak comes from illegal fishing. In 2017, we partnered with the World Economic Forum to exercise the possibility of detecting the vessels that are engaged in illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. So we partnered with a couple of data providers. One of them was Spire. And what you see, these blue lines here, there are traces of vessels. You know, every vessel has this localization device. So we use this data from the Spire to actually trace all the ships around the world. But is there a lot of fishing activity? It certainly, there certainly is a lot of it. But you know, if you are engaged in illegal fishing, would you let the localization device on? I bet no, right? So what do we do then? We know that somebody may dis disconnect this localization device. There comes the satellite image data. Okay, we can have this influx of the satellite images, and we were supported by the digital globe and planet with satellite images, and we trained classification algorithms to detect objects, ships. Okay, so you disconnected the localization device. Well, we can actually trace you with, with satellite images. And then what we can do, we can identify ships and we can see which of the paths that ships are taking are not, are not usual. Maybe the ships are in this exclusive economic zone. Maybe the ships are in uh, marine protected areas, or maybe they're just having a path that kind of indicates that it's illegal fishing going on. So what we did, we designed this tool that as things are evolving, we associate a risk score to say this vessel is engaged in illegal activity. Okay, I bet that many of you actually in your companies have algorithms that are predicting churn, predicting who responds to your marketing campaigns or not. But let me share with you something. This does not systematically happen where you would expect it to happen, in the governments, where we can actually create the most of the impact. Huh? Not for cash, but for the benefit of a single person or thousands of them. And uh, in 2018, we were approached by Croatian Institute for Public Health. It's hard to believe that today, only eight out of 28 European Union countries have the herd, have the vaccination rates that allow for the herd immunity. If you don't know what is herd immunity, it means that 95% of the population needs to be vaccinated. And we're talking about deadly diseases that are eradicated, like rubeola, measles. And in Croatia, some red flags started going on when they understood that almost 44% of the kids did not receive the first dosage of the MMR vaccination. And they reached out to us and asked us, can you help us do something? And, okay, we visualized the whole process of what happens for the vaccination, when the vaccination is supposed to happen, and we tried to look for a place. Where exactly should we start predicting so that we buy six months or one year to Croatian Institute of Public Health to design campaigns and approach these parents and potentially convince them to make the decision that will not only protect their children, but also everybody else. And this is what we did. We tried to put the uh, predictive algorithms and we hope that in the, this year we will implement this system. So what we're doing, we can potentially change the future. We can prevent deadly things to happen. Okay, the goal of all these things that I've showed you, these examples, is not for technology per se, it's to actually build uh, oh, sorry, to build sustainable tourism. Yeah? Nobody wants to live in a city that is crowded with tourists, but we would like the tourists to come to, to uh, Florence and then to enjoy the beauty of Florence, but we would also like the citizens to feel happy about that. What can we do? We're trying to build sustainable tourism, to build more resilient city of Rotterdam, to control the tuna population and do something that will be even beneficial for those that are thinking short term gaining money with illegal fishing. And we want to do a better public health. And if you ask me, we are very, very slow. Because for each of these projects, and we had a 60, 60 such projects in the Data Science for Social Good, we need to talk with dozens of different organizations, governments from all over the world. And I'm super surprised with the interest, but also we learned quite a lot of things. Here is what our learnings. We're anchored in the past. 
You know all those processes, how we create data and how we create perception of what is happening? Well, they, they hardened over time. They're baked through the evolution process. And now it's very hard to change them. What we have is a vision or perception of a reality that is not the same as the reality. I mean, look, we're talking here about robots. I bet that if you go to a public hospital, you will see things that you will not like. If you go to the public schools, you will see things that you will not like. It's very far from the robots and artificial intelligence that you are talking. If you go to the government, although the Portuguese government is so showing some signals, you would be terrified with how backward things are. And you know, so we first start is their data. There is always a perception that there is data. But you know, there is a problem and there is a potentially desired question. But the data is collected for different reasons. Not to give insights. The data is collected to show where's the money going. The data is collected to protect me when somebody wants to sue me. Now here is the data. You cannot do anything for me, right? So we are not collecting data to generate knowledge. We have to rethink our processes. You know, and then we get this beautiful visualization with this graph. Well, the question then becomes, so which action can I take given the information provided with this graph? And this is where most of our projects fail. People say, well, there is nothing that I can do. There is an initial statement I can do, I can change processes. And then when we start seeing things, well, you know, there is this dependency. Well, I'm going to offend this institution. I'm going to offend this guy, that guy. And what happens? There is no change. And there is this common thing. I don't know if you know this character huh? from the movie. He's worried about, about everything. And the fear is good. And I'm not saying that we should not fear of technology. But let me challenge you. There is some common fear of algorithms labeling people. Well, if you just travel around and see how, and, and just, you know, turn the blind on off, blind eye off, you will see how much are each of us labeling. And you will see that much of what we are doing today is also labeling. All the time, wrong predictions. Oh, this algorithm is going to be horrible. Well, there is scientific evidence that in some cases, if you, anybody of you, would just toss a coin, you would be much more successful than experts making decisions. I'm saying a random selection would be outperforming experts. And now we're afraid that algorithms that are, that are outperforming random selections are bad and they're wrong. Why aren't we so uh, scrutinizing our own decision-making process? A loss of privacy. Sure, we're very cheap. I don't know how many times did you say yes after the regulation of European Union, just giving data just to solve something. Oh, come on, don't ask me these questions. I know this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to give it away. Just give me what I need. But then when you're asked to, do your, to give your data for something that will create social good, ah, but you know, I have to think. Well, I'm not sure. The government can do many things with this, you know. And algorithms can go rogue. But let me challenge you. I'm more afraid of humans going, humans and power going rogue. How much processes do we need to instigate when somebody crazy comes to a place with power, especially with a nuclear button or something else? And algorithms, you know, for algorithms, we can design the switch off and it can happen instantly. For humans, it cannot. And let me put you in a situation. If you know that there is a medicine, and I don't know how often after the doctor tells you to take a medicine that will solve a problem, you read the side effects. Well, some of the side effects are just horrifying, but you still take the medicine. And you know if a kid takes this medicine, the kid will die. So you keep it, you think you keep it somewhere safe. I've seen horrible medicines just at the reach of children. But now we're afraid of the side effects of algorithms that we can control. To end up in a little of the, uh, with, a, with a little note that I would like for you to keep in your mind, there is terribly many things for us to do. There is no lack of knowledge. There is no lack of technology. To share some love, although I'm from Nova, just go to Technico and see wonderful potential that is there. That incredible knowledge that people have there. Well, what do we need? We need you guys, leaders. We need you to first understand the opportunities and challenges. 
We need better tools so that these processes of experimentation and the application of technology are easier. We need more collaboration. It is horrible when I talk to the governments and they tell me, you know, educational ministry have this data, but then when person grows up, it's in the ministry of, of labor, and we never talk, and you know it's political, so we're never going to connect. And we know that it would be better if we talk, but we don't talk. I mean, what excuses can you take? When you know that you can do things, we need stronger commitments. If you know that you can change things, what is stopping you? Don't... Don't uh, provoke the waves, because the waves may go where you don't want them to go. Huh? And we need the willingness to experiment. And it's not a problem to fail. You think Google comes with these solutions because they're just, ah, uh, it's wonderful. They fail thousands of times, thousands of times. But they keep learning, and then they produce something that is perfect. And I'm happy to see Kamen Municipal of Kashkais coming with his command center and investing in trying to, to find the... the the happiness of each of the citizens. But I ask you, if you have a chance to make, to save one life or more, if you have a chance to make one person better off, let's not go for 10,000, what is stopping you really to accept this? The, well, what is stopping you to not making an action? I don't think that the status quo is what we should rest with. So thank you very much.